Clarice asked me to do this talk uh, just over a week ago, and I am going to slightly change the title of the talk that we're going to do tonight because I think it reflects better what I'm going to be talking about, and I think what's probably what you'll hopefully be uh, interested in hearing about this evening. Um, I hope, given this is all voluntary time, that uh, what I talk about will, if not, if not, if it's not fun, it will at least be educational. Um, uh, so what I would sort of title this talk is really the uh, genomic prediction is genomic prediction using linear models. And let me get my slides up. Uh, da, da, da. There we go. So can you all see them? No, wrong page. That one, can you see that page? Yes, that <laughs> looks like a yes, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna try and provide you with a sort of understanding of what are called linear mixed effects models, uh, which tend to are really the most used uh, models for the, for the task of genomic prediction. Um, if time then allows me, I might end up going into multi-trait expansions of these linear mixed effects models and also possibly multi-locus expansions. And I'd also be perfectly happy to take questions after on like what I'm beginning to look at in terms of extensions of these models, how we can change them and how we can maybe look at them um, through fresh eyes or fresh goggles. Um, so I think it's good to start off with the motivations behind uh, linear mixed effects models. What's the actual point of doing this stuff? So one of the main use cases for linear mixed effects models are what are called genome-wide association studies, uh, or GWAS for, for short. Uh, so the point of GWAS is normally to basically find uh, statistical associations between what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, so little changes in genomic sequences, um, to find statistical associations between those changes in the genomic sequences and phenotypes that we observe in the, uh, in the real world. Um, you can really think of this as a sort of repeated student t-test across the um, across the sort of genomic sequence that you have. So you almost test out each polymorphism, you see how it affects the phenotype. And if there is an effect on the phenotype, you mark it down on a graph, which can then be used by others later on. Um, it really comes at the problem from a reductionist perspective. So you're looking to basically give insight to molecular biologists who might be studying uh, why the cell behaves in a certain way under certain conditions, or in pharmacology, they might use it to figure out new drug targets um, for particular diseases. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, a second motivation would be precision medicine, or you could think of it as systems medicine, or uh, P4 medicine is one that they're all sort of roughly, well, to my mind anyway, I could be wrong, but the same sort of thing. Um, P4, I think, gives a really good description where the four Ps stand for uh, predictive, preventative, personalized, and participatory. Now, the predictive part is essentially the part that, again, genomic prediction comes into and gets it. We basically are able to take genomic data from an individual and from that genomic data, predict the likelihood that at some stage during their life, they will develop some form of a disease. Um, what then happens is a doctor will receive that data and they will come up with a personalized plan uh, in order to actually take preventative measures to stop your health trajectory tending towards that disease. Uh, then what happens is you have the participatory part whereby you actually have to do something. Now, Alison Woolard, who I think is a fantastic speaker, has a very nice line on this when she says she loves the idea, but thinks uh, it might come back to just telling people to eat healthier and take a little bit more exercise uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. Really, though, it's more of a holistic approach to this stuff, I would say. Um, yeah. Uh, so what I'm particularly interested in is genetic breeding. So really, I'm interested, as I think there's some other people who work 
uh, at uh, at synthetic meat companies, that sort of stuff here. But I'm interested in ensuring people are fed and fed sustainably into the future. It's really, really what sort of got me to do the PhD in the first place. Um, and if we look back to the 1960s, the last time that the world was beginning to look like it would become particularly short of food, well, badly short of food in certain areas, you had what was called the Green Revolution, in which, uh, in which breeding new breeding algorithms, which were based on methods developed by a guy called Charles Henderson in the 1940s, they were introduced to breed new varieties of things like wheat, uh, drought resistant wheat, which could be used in uh, in countries such as India, Pakistan, all of that sort of stuff. Without it's thought that without the introduction of um, obviously these are estimates, but without the introduction of those uh, methods, the new breeding methods, you'd have roughly a billion more people today who would have gone into starvation. In my from my perspective, I think that these algorithms are one of the ways that we are going to be able to reduce hunger into the future and um, and also do it in a sustainable manner because of increasing pressures on land use, how we're going to have to basically farm more sustainably, uh, producing more produce on less land. Um, so... Yeah, so what's the, what is genomic prediction? What's the actual idea? Um, so genomic prediction basically comes from the perspective that there exists patterns within one's genotype which should mirror patterns displayed by one's phenotype. So there's a, some form of a mapping between your genomic data and your phenotypic data. Um, the assumption is then that we should be able to formalize this mapping mathematically. And if we can formalize this mathematic, this mapping mathematically, then we can use it to do all of that stuff I've, I've just mentioned. Um, so the components of uh, the components that we actually need to do this stuff are like any sort of prediction problem are essentially we need some data to work with. We need a model and uh, that can take in the data and then that model should uh, give us back some prediction. Um, the data in our case is genomic data. Uh, the model are linear mixed effects models and the predictions that we're going to be focused on in this talk are quant what are called quantitative predictions. So they tend to be Gaussian distributed and they uh, could be things like the protein content of wheat, for example. Um, yeah, so the example I'm going to use and we sort of put together for today's talk is um, is going to be about the opaqueness of a parakeet. So it will hopefully stick in the head. But what we're going to look at is we're going to look at four colours in the parakeet and how light or dark those colours are. So if you start off, the first colour we're going to look at is uh, the grey Chin, the grey lower beak, not chin, of the parakeet. We're also going to look at the red feathers, so how light or dark those are, um, the blue feather tips, uh, and the sort of yellowy green ones in the middle. Um, so the first thing we then need once we've got this problem, like the other thing to note is that in our population that we're going to use for this example, we have four individuals um, which come from two families located in two different continents. So one family is going to be located in Australia, and the second family is going to be located in... Uh, in Sorry, Jenny, um, could you mute your mic, please? Um, so then what we do, so we get our data, so we're given some form of a data set. In this case, uh, the data set will be in the form of uh, a, a gene content data set. So in, uh, it's a dip, we're assuming that it's a diploid organism. Uh, and what that means is that each SNP, so you can see a whole bunch of SNPs here, uh, has one of three states. So either it's homozygous recessive, it's homozygous dominant, or it's heterozygous. Um, 
the important one of the important things to notice at this stage with this is in the same way that I said we're getting birds from two populations, we have uh, genomic sequences which are more similar for the first two samples and then more similar for the second two samples. So the first two samples tend to be two small a's, the second two samples tend to be two large a's. Um, so what we do at first is we have to encode this in some way in order to make the downstream analysis we do slightly, uh, slightly easier. Um, and so what we do is we we try to we figure out what is the uh, the least commonly occurring allele at each SNP. So uh, an allele would either be a small a or a large a in this case, and we will basically encode the genomic data as a count of the least commonly occurring allele. So for SNP one, we have uh, or. SNP8 is a good example where the least commonly occurring allele can be seen to be the small a, which means uh, when we encode it, the first value will be 0, uh, 0.0 because we're centering this encoding on zero. Uh, the second one will be one because there are two small a's. The third and the fourth will both be minus one. So we have this now encoded numerical data set. Um, what we need is a model. Um, so, um, yeah, so what we have is a linear mixed effects model. Um, now, the linear mixed effects model, I think, can be visualized quite nicely using heat maps. So we have, um, we have four heat maps here. We basically, what the assumption is, is that we decompose the phenotype into contributions from three separate, uh, three separate, other heat maps, three separate areas, which are added together to create the phenotype. So if we take the example of the first individual who's on the first row, uh, the, the sort of first row of values all the way across, we can see that they've got some very light red uh, feathers, which are that those light red feathers are a combination of some fairly dark uh, red feathers that come from the fixed effects, some very light ones from the random effects, and some sort of medium ones from the background noise. Um, then if we take, as another example, the uh, green feathers, the sort of of the third individual, which is very dark, we then have a fairly light, a sort of reasonably dark fixed effect, reasonably dark random effect, and reasonably dark background noise. We just add them together and we get uh, the phenotypic values. Um, so, what the fixed effects do, the fixed effects are essentially what we're interested in from a reductionist perspective. They are the, um, the, the, they're basically the effects that the SMP, the SNPs have on the phenotype. So they're the effects that the genomic sequences from a particular organism has on the phenotype. The random effects account for what we would call confounding factors. So these tend to be things that differ between the organisms in a non-random manner, um, but they're not related to the genomic data. So in our case, that's the fact that we've got two parrots from England and uh, two parakeets from England and two parakeets from their native Australia. Um, and then the final one is we've got the background noise, which is just, you know, sampling noise. We can't really do it. It's a fact that we can't really do anything about it. It's a fact of life. It's just there and we have to uh, deal with it. Um, so I'd like to sort of get you to think just for 10 seconds about the uh, component, the components of this model, it, hypothetical situation, but the components of this model that would change if we raise the exact same two parakeets but we switch the countries um we switch the countries in which they were raised so same genomic sequences but the countries in which they were raised changed a bit and how would it affect our uh heat maps and i'll just give you 10 seconds to think about that So from that sort of hypothetical situation, what we would hope we would see uh, with this model is the phenotype would of course change because it's the effects of the other things. 
the fixed effects should remain the same. They should be a sort of ground truth whereby the genomic effects of the parents in Australia should have the same effects as the genomic effects from the parents in uh, the parakeets in Britain. Um, the background noise should then change completely randomly. I mean, we just don't know how it's going to change. We can't really control it. It, it, just, it just changes randomly. We can't tell if there's any similarity between the former background noise and the new background noise. Um, the random effects are a bit more interesting though. So the random effects do change, but they change in a very structured manner, whereby once again, you have, um, so last time we had two light reds on the top. So two light red feathers on the top and two dark on the bottom. This time we have two dark red feathers on the top, but two light red on the bottom. And with the random effects, we had two uh, light red, uh, like green feathers, on the top and two dark green feathers on the bottom. This time we have two dark green feathers on the top and two light green on the bottom. So what I'm trying to get at is the fact that the, the random effects will change in a sort of structured manner. Essentially any individuals that are related to each other will tend to stay related to each other when considering the random effects in the future. Um, so how do we encode this these ideas about uh, the contributions to phenotypic observations uh, mathematically. Um, this is where the sort of linear mixed effects models uh, come in, and this is what linear mixed effects models do. But essentially, we can see the, um, the phenotypic effects as uh, being drawn from a normal distribution. And that normal distribution is made up a couple of, of a couple of different components. So um, the fixed effect components would tend to represent the sort of mean of that normal distribution. And the uh, error effects are also drawn from a normal distribution and they're, they're controlled, they're zeroed, they're set to a mean of zero and their variance is controlled by some parameter sigma, which will estimate at a later stage, uh, multiplied by the uh, identity matrix, which essentially has one on the diagonals and zero on the off diagonals. <clears throat> what, that, what that identity matrix um, encodes is it encodes the assumption that the background noise uh, is varies with varies with no structure between all of the different dimensions that we're drawing it from. So it's a multivariate Gaussian and the variance in one dimension is in no way related to the variance in another direct dimension. Um, then the U, so the random effects are once again drawn from a normal distribution, but this time with a variance which is uh, controlled by the parameter uh, mu and uh, and has a structure which is given by a matrix G. Um, and the G matrix basically gives the random effects this structure that's able to account for environment. So really what we want to ask ourselves now, we know all of the sort of parts of this model, um, apart from the design matrix G. So we want to ask ourselves, what is G? How do we encode it? How is it put together? Um, so essentially the way that G works is uh, we're looking to correct for confounding factors which tend to be in line with uh, environmental variation or non-random environmental variation between individuals. Um, what, so hereditary relationship, essentially all organisms are, are related. Um, and some organisms tend to be related, are related a little bit more than others. Related organisms often end up uh, residing in fairly similar environments to one another. So we take the parakeets from Australia versus the parakeets from Britain. It's likely that the parakeets from Australia are more related than the parakeets for Brit from Britain. Um, and related organisms also have more similar genomes. That's essentially what being more related means. So. G therefore measures this the hereditary relationship between organisms in our data set. Um, and hence we call it the genomic relationship matrix. But what it's also capable of acting as a proxy for 
are those environmental differences between organisms in our data set? Um, so how do we calculate G? What, what actually are the sort of components that we can put together to give us this genomic, this matrix, which encodes information about the sort of relationship between organisms in the population? Um, the genomic relationship matrix, uh, so we, we have two components of the matrix. The top one, the X, uh, the X dot X transpose, is really where most of the meat in this equation comes in. It's most, it's where the interesting elements of the equation come in. The bottom elements essentially scale the matrix, but what they do is quite interesting. They basically give uh, more weight to, let's say you have two individuals who have the same uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, but it's a very rare single nucleotide polymorphism. What it does is it will, increase the value of the relationship between those two um, individuals because you know if you have a very rare change then that acts as something that makes you more likely to be related. Um, the X transpose X matrix though so it's calculated from the genomic data um, so let's take a look at actually what it is in our case and that should give us some intuition as to how it works. Right. Oh there we go okay that might start jumping around. Yeah. OK, um, so the genomic relationship, uh, the genomic relationship matrix in our case uh, can be seen as follows. Essentially, what we have are the uh, diagonal, the two, we have two different sort of elements of both encode two different types of information. We have diagonal elements. Uh, which count the number of homozygous loci for each individual. Now, in the case of the simulation that I've done in this one, they're all 900. That's not a very realistic, it's just not a very realistic part of the simulation. Normally, there would be some variation within the number of homozygous uh, loci that each individual has. Uh, remember, homozygous loci being whether or not you have two A, two large A's or two small A's uh, at that particular, at a particular SNP in your genomic sequence. The off diagonals um, are very interesting there and very useful for us. So the off di diagonals count the number of shared alleles between two individuals. Um, this basically means that a larger number means two individuals are more related uh, and a smaller number means they're less related. So if we look in this example at individual naught and individual one, who are the parakeets who come from Britain, then we've got an off diagonal of 772, a very large value, whereupon naught and two is minus 760. So they're very different. And then two and three is 775. So they're very similar. So this matrix basically encodes all of the information about the hereditary relationships in our data set. Um, so what we do is we just go and chuck this into our linear mix effects model uh, into the, uh, and it basically forms the multivariate Gaussian from which we can draw a vector u. Now, um, yes, oh wait, that's done. Yeah, so we can then say that y comes from a normal distribution with a mean which is uh, controlled by the fixed effects and a uh, variance uh, which is controlled by the random effects and the, um, and the background noise. So that idea that those are where those different elements come into our distribution y gives you a bit of information as to why they're used. Um, so let's break down, like, let's try and take a look at what this, I mean, sometimes I think the sort of notation for normal distributions can look not particularly nice, but let's just try and visualize it a little bit more to try and get an understanding behind it. So essentially the, what the X alpha component does is it's sort of basically a linear model component. It's like you have a normal linear model, uh, which is in this case, it would be the red line, but in a uh, multi-dimension. So we'd call it a hyperplane. Um, and what you're looking for is the X alpha, which uh, 
basically reduces the distance between that line and the observations that we see in Y. Um, so the second, the Y would be the blue dots in this case. The variance component then, so the mu G plus sigma I, um, let's consider what that does. Uh, so if you consider a, um, if you consider what a normal linear model would look like, you would just have the sigma i component of this variance structure. And what that essentially means is that the variance in all of these different directions is the same. It, it, it's, it's all controlled by the parameter sigma, and you don't have different variances in the different dimensions of your uh, normal distribution. Uh, by, but by adding in this uh, mu g element, it means that uh, the variance differs in different dimensions. So, and it's essentially uh, controlled. So the, the amount of variance are in the, um, the amount of variance in the different dimensions is uh, controlled by the homozygous, the number of homozygous loci the individual have, uh, which tends to be just vary around a certain numbers, but it's then scaled to the number of, uh, the number of the, the basically the minor allele frequency uh, for that um, for the I slightly lost my train of thought there. Um, the yeah the the what then happens is the covariance between the uh, so the covariance between the variance in those different dimensions is related to what you got from your genomic relationship matrix. So if you have a high variance in a particular observation in the British parents, but a low variance in the Australian parents, then it will basically encode that type of a thing. Um, yeah. So uh, where are we on to next? Yeah, so to so sort of finish up, I want to just go over then how we, um, how we then begin to use these models once we've got them. Um, and that sort of essentially rounds our whole story up. So we built you all the way up from how the model's built, the data we've used, the model we get, uh, how we have to, it's important to say that we have to optimize, I thought we skipped one, we have to optimize uh, we basically what we do is once we've got this normal distribution, we estimate the these three parameters, so the alpha, the mu, and the sigma, in order to best explain the observations that we've seen in our data. Once we get these parameters, these parameters are basically are the things that we can do useful things with. So the alpha, uh, the alpha essentially encodes the effect that each SNP has on the genotype. Um, and that is what we then use to do things like uh, Manhattan plots. Uh, so this is a Manhattan plot from a genome-wide association study. Along the, exact, along the x-axis, we have the loci of the single nucleotide polymorphism. And then um, on the y-axis, we have uh, log to the base 10 p-values. Uh, these tend to be very, very, very strict p-values. It changes for different problems, but um, but yeah, so, and that's to do normally to do with the di dimensionality of the data, the fact that you have these data sets, which can quite often be sort of 50,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms long, but only a couple of hundred individuals type of thing. Um, and then the different chromosomes are encoded by the different colors. So this is the type of thing that a biologist would receive and go, okay, I know where to begin my search. Um, then the final thing is agricultural breeding algorithms. So this stuff, once we have a good model that's able to do fairly strong predictions, we can chuck it onto uh, stuff like cultivating wheat and improving productivity in wheat uh, yields. Um, I'd like to say a quick thank you to some of the people that I work with and help me out with some of the work that I do. Uh, so Professor Ross King, Stasia Grinberg, uh, 
Richard Harrison, JK and Amanda McGarvey, who all of whom work in or around the uh, National Institute of Agricultural Botany in Cambridge. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. And please do uh, ask any questions you might have. Uh, well, thank you so much, Harry, for such a wonderful talk. And just to the dot, <laughs> 30 minutes. Um, I want to start with my question. Yeah, I, have the yeah, I was trying to. I... Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, did I yeah, sorry, I thought, I believe it was supposed to be 30 minutes, I suspect. Yes, if yes. If not, I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is one to have 30 minutes of question and some stuff like that. So I'm sure a lot of the other okay. members here share, because they share your similar backgrounds of being in mathematics and engineering, would also be interested in how did you make the jump to biology? <laughs> Sorry. Did Hello. You hear? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just Sorry, how I did you make it? I got to the okay. It's my connection band. Sorry. How did you make the jump into no, I think it might be me. <laughs> how did you make the jump into biology? Because you come from a mathematical engineering uh, background. Um so I suppose I, I mean, I sort of set my traits, it goes back to that desire to work on um, work on problems that will somehow improve the way, uh, improve the ability of people to feed themselves into the future is a problem that I think is going to be, well, because it has the potential to be a huge problem in the period of our lifetimes imminently. And um, I think more work needs to be done on it. The second part of it is that I find a lot of the a lot of the models and the so I come from a mathematical modeling background um, more than anything else. I studied engineering mathematics at the University of Bristol beforehand. Um, and a lot of what we did was the application of mathematics to to things like biological situations, actually. And that gave me, I would say, a real love and enjoyment for the sort of complexities of applying maths to uh, situations whereby whereby i mean some of the normal laws of statistics seem to break down like the fact that you have this molecule in dna that is essentially a crystalline molecule and it seems to reform itself again and again and again throughout time i i, I find all of these like some of these ideas mind-blowing and i don't think that we have the mathematical tools yet to fully explain them oh, thank you anyone else has any questions? I have another one if uh, everybody is too stunned yet to have. So um, how did you actually collect the data? Because I assume it must take some time for you to go to, you know, from the actual phenotype and are you working um, with so there are some very sophisticated uh some very sophisticated people at places like the national institute of the niab where i work i tend to work with niab data sets um who spend years designing particular breeding studies so at the moment uh one of the main data sets i'm working on is called the niab diverse magic and it's essentially a data set which has been uh it's a cross of um eight uh, or 16 founders and it's essentially this funneled cross whereby you've literally got pretty much every single um crossbreed that you could possibly have through six folds of breeding and it, it it gives you a description of the last 70 years worth of breeding in uh british agriculture and really in your Euro wider Euro european agriculture so assets like that are really important to have Lots of the data sets, suspect, particularly in plant, plant breeding, and it's why I also enjoy this area more than uh, others, is that lots of the data sets are out there and available to use. There's much less ethical problems around the using of this information, and yet the models that you build are still um, applicable to, to human studies. You can do tests on crops, essentially, that you can't do on humans, or sometimes, like quite often, model organisms like mice and things like that as well. So 
I just come in at the uh, get given the data, fortunately, don't have to go through the tiresome habit of having to measure it or anything like that. Okay, nice. So you even work with the mammalian. Oh, okay. There's a question that comes up uh, regarding the GRM elements models. Your frequencies are based on allele frequency, nor not genotype frequencies, right? So in the GRM, it's based on allele. Uh, yeah, allele frequencies. Um, I don't quite know what you mean by genotype frequency. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, it's based on allele frequencies. Um, Essentially, it's it's all to do. I mean, it all kind of comes back to that encoding of how we encode uh, the genotype using the, the genome using the um, the minor, the least commonly occurring allele as uh, the allele that we count everything with. But if you did it with genotypes, I suspect you'd still get some. I mean, if you did it just as in you went not one two, you probably or maybe if that's what you mean you'd get the same sort of thing for certain bits of the equation, but what you wouldn't get is the, um, what you would lose actually is the, uh, in the GRM, you'd lose the counts of, you basically lose the similarity element. So you'd probably have to treat your equation slightly differently, but I'm sure you could still do it. Yeah. Pretty much. So you essentially have a Hardy Weinberg model first of your gene set. I've still got, I believe so, I've still got to get myself to grips a bit more with the Hardy, the, the Hardy Weinberg model, but I believe that is that what well, might be the case. I'm afraid I'm so that is the multi-allele regulation. Um is the bit that sort of forms extensions of this stuff. And I've got, I've actually got a slide. So I've taken this from another group who work out of Cambridge whose work I'm quite interested in. But again, I think, I think just linear models in general with this stuff uh, might sort of run into complexities eventually, run into problems eventually. But the, so if I go back to share screen, let me get my, um, yeah, so that is a, yeah, so empty sets, multiple loci. Yeah, so essentially the way that if this is the question that you're asking, uh, Clarissa, please tell me, end up, please do tell me if it's not, because I can't see the chat anymore. Um, but if this is the question you're asking, essentially what we do when we're doing um, multi loci or multi phenotype tests are we, uh, so if you see, we've got our sort of our model again, we've got our linear mixed effects model. Uh, the way we would do the single loci uh, test to produce the uh, genome-wide association study, the, the Manhattan plot, is that we would encode a particular SNP as the uh, vector G. So G would essentially have a one where the uh, SNP that we're wanting to test is. And uh, we would estimate whether the parameter beta is statistically significant from zero. So whether it actually has a statistic, whether there is actually a statistically significant difference between uh, beta, our hypothesis naught is beta equals naught, basically. Um, then to expand that to uh, multi-loci, what we do is we change that beta G into a regional component. We essentially encode it in the exact same way that we encode the genomic relationship matrix. Um, we just do it on a local level. So we take our like six single nucleotide polymorphisms, let's say if we're looking at six of them, and we calculate a another genomic relationship matrix between all of those. And, uh, and then we would estimate the, uh, we want to check whether the parameter sigma differs significantly from zero. So in this case, our null hypothesis is that sigma is uh, zero. Um, in this case, I bad notation, I shouldn't have used big R, small R, but R basically represents the um, 
the regional GRM. Now this, I haven't, I realized I haven't actually got the citation on it. This model is done by a guy called, uh, I think it's mainly the work of a guy called uh, uh, Franc or Pablo Casale, who works at the Sainsbury's Laboratory, the Sainsbury's Lab in Cambridge as well. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. In in terms of actually one other thing is in terms of the, if we're then expanding that from just the set test, so multiple loci to multiple phenotypes as well, what we do is we suddenly have a Y, which is, um, we have a Y, which is a matrix. So the full phenotypes for a particular observation. And then we have, uh, a normal distribution, similar sort of normal distribution, but this time we are estimating the CRCG and the uh, the the capital uh, sigma um, or capital epsilon. I can't remember what that is. Uh, but what we do is we multiply those uh, those value. We we basically do a um, a yeah, chronica product, which essentially, if you had like, if you had a two by two matrix and you multiply it by another two by two matrix using the chronic product, what you'll get is uh, the sort of first element multiplied by the four elements of the first matrix, the second element multiplied by four elements of the second matrix. So you, you're exploding the size of the matrix really, um, and sort of looking at all of the different components together, and then you get the covariances, which can help with finding the elements of the genome which actually uh, affect phenotypic traits quite often uh, quite often you have cases where a, a you uh, so you have a single element of genomic sequences which will have an effect on multiple traits like auxin in plants i think is a pretty good example i'll go back so i can see the question yeah i'll just tell you okay <laughs> you can read it uh, so Yes. Another question related to the random effects. Is there a way to perceive or measure a buffered environment, like when comparing two or more similar environments? So, so if the environments aren't similar, essentially that, like, I mean, when you say buffered, how buffered are you meaning? Is it is it like they're very similar environments, they're totally similar, or they're just there's a little bit of difference between the two? If I could ask, I think I'd rather turn our mic <laughs> mic this time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the previous explanation. That were wonderful. Um, no, the idea is that I, I know a little bit of the genetic population. I mean, I'm not an ecologist. I'm totally the opposite yeah. in the biophysics, but um, it's, an, it's such an amazing topic for me now that I'm moving toward that. So I was wondering if there's a thing that you can more or less compare that variation, like for example, this is environment A and then environment B, and then yeah. if these are more or less similar, more or less having the same structure, but perhaps this one is moving at a different rate or changing at a different rate. Is there a way that you can more or less compare that, like probably in the, in in, uh, in comparison to environment C, that is totally different mm. from those two? Is there a way that mm. you can more or less say, okay, these two are, mm, I wouldn't say buffer, maybe not what's not the right uh, word, but I would say oh. they share a similar, but not exactly the same thing, a similar um, so, configuration. Yeah, I, I think I'm. Getting what you're seeing it's almost like you're trying to uh it, correct me if i'm wrong but you're trying to basically get intuition about the dynamics of the different environments rather than the dynamics of okay yeah so one of the nice things i find with these type with essentially linear models linear mixed effects models this way of approaching um uh modeling stuff is that uh, quite often i think it can be quite intuitive how to update your model in order to start taking into account new things so i haven't seen anyone doing that stuff which is interesting mm. um but uh what you could probably do is break your environmental component up into three different gaussians and have basically a design matrix which accounts for the organisms that are in, like you might do a spectral clustering, let's say, or some sort of clustering, like 
K nearest neighbors clustering with three different uh, neighbors would give you three environments and you cluster the genotypes mm -hmm. into those environments. And then what you would do is you'd separate them out into different Gaussians and estimate, then multiply it by a parameter on each Gaussian and estimate those parameters again. And what those parameters would then give you is the information that the contribution from those different environments to the final prediction is what I would, that's the way I would mm. sort of, I think I would approach problem, but I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> awesome. <my> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, No other questions for Harry. Then thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining. Um, I hope that you can join our meetup group and uh, the Google group as well to find us and to keep updated with all the next uh, future talks. And please stay behind. Um, yeah, uh, Jenny is also offering to see this biomix space. And please see behind if you have any suggestions for future talks or you'd like to help organize the biology club, we can discuss this. But yeah, thank you again so much, Harry, for uh, this wonderful talk and everybody for coming.